Perfect. Okay. Um, thanks to everybody for joining us. This is our second in our series of uh, community calls and webinars um, for Invest in Open Infrastructure, building on the past year of work that we've done um, around the future of open scholarship and what that means for infrastructure writ large. Um, I am thrilled to be joined by Jessica Meyerson, who's the co-director of the Maintainers um, and also the director of research and strategy for the Educopia Institute. Uh, and we'll have our panelists describe a little bit more about their work in a moment, as well as Lewis Villa, uh, the co-founder and general counsel of Tidelift. Um, both of these individuals are doing some really fascinating work around the topic of maintenance, staffing, and labor in open source and open infrastructure communities, um, looking at the human cost of these systems. And as I lose my headphone here, there we go. Um, the, the reason that we wanted to have this conversation really um, is over the past year as we've been looking at the strain on infrastructure in the research and scholarship sort of spheres, um, looking at also the economics and where that human cost of budget cuts, furloughs and layoffs have affected the overall maintenance and resiliencies of the systems that we rely on to you know, produce, disseminate and share open knowledge. Um, active ongoing attention, development and stewardship of these services and also of these systems are needed to make sure that we can you know, not only maintain levels of, of service but also withstand periods of heightened demand like we've seen over the past year. Um, for the course of this conversation, we'll be hearing from Jessica and also Lewis about some of the ways in which they're approaching these issues in their own work and hopefully have that evolve into a broader, uh, robust conversation about some of the ways in which um, we can approach some of these areas um, and, and build on them to build more resilient networks of maintenance and also bring some of the sort of hidden costs and the invisible nature of the, the labor and the contributorship when it comes to these open systems to the fore. So with that, I'd love to hand it over to Jessica to in, introduce herself um, and the work she's doing and kick off today's conversation. Okay, well, huge thanks to, to Caitlin and to all the folks on the call and to Lewis um, for allowing me to be a part of the session today. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, as Caitlin already said, I'm, uh, well, I was previously Director of Research and Strategy, now Deputy Director at, at Educopia Institute, um, and that is where I get to do a range of things. Uh, these days, I do a lot of facilitation. I would consider myself a professional facilitator. I consider myself a maintainer. I come from an information science and political science background. Um, and my first professional life was in maintaining uh, long-term systems of access for different forms of data and collections. Uh, I would also consider myself an applied researcher, and we can get a little bit more into what that looks like in the maintainer sphere, and a community cultivator, which is a, a core activity and really at the crux of what Educopia Institute does. Um, I am also the co-director, again, as Caitlin mentioned, and I have the pleasure and the honor of working with uh, an incredible team, uh, Lee, both at Educopia and within the maintainers. Within the maintainers, that's Lee Vinsel, Andrew Russell, and Lauren depina Fraze. Um, and we, alongside others within uh, the broader movement building sphere around long-term thinking, are looking at maintenance not only as kind of the, the classical battle against entropy, but actually a way of, of thinking about how we relate to people and things in ways that support human flourishing. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to get into you know, the first question that, that Kay has queued up for us, but I'll hand it over to Lewis for now. Um, you know, I just, I, I want to start off by saying I'm a long-term lurker on the maintainers mailing list. So I recognize some names here from that. And I'm so thrilled to, to be able to, to chat in real time with, with Jessica. And, and I'm sure there will be some great questions in the chat as well. So, uh, I'm Louis Villa. I'm one of the, um, co-founders of Tidelift and, uh, Tidelift is a, uh, venture capital backed startup, but our goal is to, as a company, is, well, our motto is pay the maintainers. Uh, we literally have that printed on shirts. I think I'm gonna have to send one to Jessica now. Um, the, uh, we looked, um, all four of the co-founders have been involved in open source for, uh, boy, the, the entirety of this millennia, 
Um, and uh, we, uh, you know, we got together a few years ago and sort of looked around the space and a recurring theme that we kept seeing was so much labor being done to uh, keep systems afloat uh, without compensation that was um, in scale to both the scope of the problem and to the value being created. And we thought we have, we still think we have very much, uh, a mechanism by which we can help address that problem in the open source space. The open source space has a lot of weird and interesting characteristics, so it may not necessarily be applicable to a lot of different systems, but at the same time, software is for better and often in our perspective for worse taking over the world. And so we uh, you know, definitely think there's a lot of applicability across a lot of disciplines as we think of how in the modern world do we make sure that these deeply rich and complex, not just technical, but human systems are maintained in the way that we'd like to see them. Um, you know, and this is becoming, when we started, we, we found the company just a touch over four years ago, and it was something that was seen a little bit as cutting edge. And now, obviously, with White House executive orders about supply chains in the software industry, things like that, it's very much a uh, locus of discussion, you know, um, across the industry now. And so, you know, we're pretty excited about that. But also, also, it's a little terrifying, right? Because the scope of the problem is uh, such an iceberg problem. And so, um, you know, the little tip that gets talked about and the big stuff under the underwater uh, are very real. So I'm excited to be here today. Huge thanks. So, you know what, let's get into it. Um, I would love to hear from you both when we talk about um, staffing, labor, some of the strains that we've seen, especially over the past year, which I think, you know, knowing that these issues have long uh, existed within the systems. I'm, I'm not gonna be naive and say that they have not, um, but I do think that it has brought into starker relief, especially with the economic volatility, budget cuts, um, furloughs, hiring freezes, et cetera. Um, more of the dramatic effects there, especially as we're talking about some of these shared systems. Um, would love to hear from both of you as sort of an opening question, um, what you feel some of the most pressing needs or things that have bubbled to the surface over the past year uh, that stick out to you with the most prominence? Well, Lewis, I'll jump in here. That's okay. <laughs> um, and I'll just cue things up for Lewis here in a second. Um, so I'll jump in and, and throw a couple of things to the group. So the first thing, um, for many of you, you may be aware, but uh, I want to point to, and Maintainers as a whole wants to point to the work of United Way ALICE. Uh, this is a national effort that, uh, and ALICE stands for, that's A-L-I-C-E, and it stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. And I, I'll provide this link to, to Kay after the call in case people are interested in some of these resources. But, um, I want to bring them up because there is a maintainer's pyramid. So what Alice does, this is run by labor economists that became part of United Way. And specifically, we're looking at what is at the unit of the household, you know, how does the standard federal poverty line or level uh, not really jive with the reality of the cost of existing in the world um, as an employed, you know, person that's bringing in a survival budget for, for a household. And so they've done these state by state reports. And in the last couple of years, one of the things that they've done is they've gone to the Bureau of Labor and they've looked at the job categories. And many of you may have a very good follow-up question to this, which was what was the criteria for putting these different jobs in these four categories? But nonetheless, I think it's a really useful experiment because the result shows up over and over again in every single state. And that is, if I can share this picture with y'all, um, we'll see how it goes, but, and maybe not, in which case I'll just have to give it to Kay. But what the result is, is there is a, um, a pyramid, a, a occupational hierarchy, where if you divide um, Alice, which is 40% of Americans, if you divide Alice into four categories, which include um, innovators, adapters, nurturers, and infrastructures, uh, the, the bottom two nurturers and infrastructures being maintainers, what does it look like? 
Well, unsurprisingly, the maintainers are at the bottom of the period uh, pyramid, not only in terms of just the sheer quantity, you know, they are the base of, of our economy and all things that we do, but also have the lowest pay scale amongst all of those. So, um, you know, I don't know that if this is a surprising finding, but it's interesting that it reoccurs over and over again. And so that is, that's a visual guide that points directly to compensation. The, in terms of a key challenge. I think that compensation though is directly related to visibility and perception of what people do. Um, how desirable is our understanding of what that role and those activities are and where do those biases come from? So I wanna point to just a couple, of more, couple more things. When we talk about um, bias and maintenance labor and how that kind of trickles down, so to speak, to the ways in which we're cognizant of how we are and we are not making maintenance labor visible in ways that it can be more easily compensated, I just want to point out that there were studies done back in the earliest, early 20th century on occupational hierarchies, how different occupations are perceived in relationship to each other um, in terms of their desirability. And one of the things that maintainers has been looking at with a colleague, Andrew Gallup at uh, SUNY Polytechnic in New York, is how do we update that study and look at the psychology of maintenance? And so it would be a follow on where the goal is to understand and measure these occupational biases towards maintenance work in a more systematic and empirical way um, that that hasn't really been published previously. So we would provide some empirical grounding to understand the relative status of maintenance through surveys designed to look at specific characteristics of occupations that relate to maintenance. Um, and so that might be that might be a useful thing. The the last thing that I'll mention is. Um, around this concept called innovation speak. So maintainers don't think in terms of a binary of innovation versus maintenance. Um, there's a lot of really incredible innovation work that happens in the context of doing maintenance labor. Um, so we more or less make the distinction between real innovation, innovation that is responding in context to the needs of real human beings, um, as opposed to innovation speak. And this is more of the rhetorical kind of hype that we see around this. And that a lot of us might point to when we look at, you know, why certain kinds of labor or initiatives might get funded over others. So I can parse kind of some examples of innovation speak that, that have garnered some really large investments and what some of the results of that have been when consideration has not been made to how those innovations will be maintained over time. But I'll hold those concrete examples for later, just in case we have time and hand it over to Lewis. I don't know that we're gonna have time because there are about half a dozen sentences that you just gave there that we could talk for just the whole hour about. And uh, I, I wanna call out one in particular, this notion of status and hierarchy and uh, because it is so, uh, I actually think it's really critical to how software in particular has been misunderstood as a maintenance problem because software is seen, software development is seen as such a high status profession, right? And, and we often uh, sort of sadly joke within Tidelift that we are working on behalf of the least oppressed laboring class in all of history. Right, uh, but it is nevertheless a labor class, right? And uh, and the and so a lot of the dynamics here, people are like, oh, woe is me, the 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 lowly software developer who only makes a, a meager six figures, um, and yet at the same time, there's very much this dichotomy even within the uh, software industry of high status innovation versus low status maintenance. We did a survey recently. Uh, where one of the comment of maintain of software open source software maintainers, and one of the quotes that came back was someone talking about how uh, open source software maintenance is sort of like goodwill hunting in reverse, where you start off as this lauded genius and you end up doing uh, you you end up doing maintenance at the end of it right where nobody actually likes you and nobody respects you. And, uh, and that's a very real dynamic and is perpetuated in part by the institutions that we build, right? So like Google, for example, all of you have probably used a Google project that one day you get a little pop-up like, sorry, Google has gotten bored and moved on. 
And well, why is that? It's in part because internally, Google uh, rewards people who build new things and under systematically under rewards or does not reward at all people who continue working on old projects within Google, right? And that's symptomatic of the entire software industry. And to get back to Kay's question of like, what have we seen in the past year is just a sort of explosion of understanding that this is, that this is real and impactful. Right, so I have a slide that I often show. I'm gonna try to see if I can uh, just share this one slide right now. And the answer to that is maybe. Can you see a slide? Yeah, all right. The applications that you all use in your lives, right, as uh, as software um, as software users, and I'm sure some of you, I know at least a couple people in the audience also software maintainers, um, are built on these huge. Uh, chunks of open source. So you have at the top the stuff that you wrote yourself. You have this middle layer of open source stuff that you just downloaded from the internet. And like, it's not even a matter of, you know, Jessica, I think it's very right to call out the visibility of labor. But in this case, it's not even the visibility of labor. It's the visibility of the things that are being used because they're often just being pulled in automatically by a developer without much thinking about it. You might not even know that you're using the thing, much less know who is providing the labor for the thing. And then there's this layer at the bottom uh, that is well-known projects that uh, even non-software developers may have heard about like Linux, right? And much of the resources and attention goes to this small layer of projects that's really well-known. Uh, and that is, really great for those projects, but at the same time, uh, really challenging for those, uh, those sort of middle layer of stuff that you've never heard of, but gets used every single day, right? We had this, there was an example of a few years back in open source, a, a thing called LeftPad, which all it did was take text and left justify it. Literally like five, 10 lines of code. The maintainer got burnt out, decided, that they were sick of doing this, deleted it from the internet and it broke, uh, a, like somebody estimated 30% of the world's websites broke. Like, I think that estimate's probably a little high, but the fact that that's like even in the realm of plausibility because somebody deleted like this tiny little snippet of code that just left justify some text tells you how fragile all of this is. And for a long time, you know, Kay, again, to this, like what has changed in the past year is I think there's an increasing awareness. We've been building for 20 years on this pyramid of open source. And it's mostly been, it has in many ways led to this amazing flourishing, but we're finally really coming face to face with the cost of that flourishing, both the economic cost. And Jessica, as you say, you know, that left pad maintainer didn't just, it wasn't like a fit of peak. It wasn't like, you know what I really want to do? I, you know, you go to bed on a, it, it literally happened on a, like a Saturday, right? It wasn't like this person went to bed on a Friday, like, oh yeah, you know, I'm in a great mood. Wake up on Saturday. I want to break the internet. No, they had been burnt to a crisp for, for a long time. And this was just sort of that final snapping point. Um, that really revealed so much fragility and built up pressure points within the system. Yeah. And just real quick to, to Lewis's point, you know, with, and Kay's original question in terms of like trends over the last years, it might be helpful to put a little historical context in there too around the innovation speak piece. This is covered um, by Lee and Andy, which are standards and technology historians, um, both and. And in their book, The Innovation Delusion, which was published in the last year or so, they provide this. And I think it's really help, it's really helpful because you might be asking the question, well, where did all of this focus on innovation for innovation's sake come from? Like, well, when did this innovation uh, speak kind of peak or become so pervasive and how we think about what's valued and what's not valued? And um, this is actually a product of the late 19th century and early 20th century at which point science and technology, which was being experienced by a really unprecedented number of people at that time as the benefits of industrialization and mass manufacturing, that those ideas became very closely coupled to social progress. 
So admittedly, the coupling made sense because many of the innovations at the time were resulting from um, you know, government investment in national infrastructure, uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of the, these investments that resulted in significant transformations in people's quality of life. I mean, we're talking about health, we're talking national health, access to education, the economy, making it a global powerhouse. So the height of innovation speak actually spans from the late 1970s to now, which is a period in which, as Lee and Andy point out in the book, Economists have actually noted that the rate of what we would consider, you know, real or substantive innovation has actually decreased in the same period. And I think that's so interesting. So that might just provide a little bit of historical grounding for maybe why we sort of are caught up in this discourse. And that wasn't a direct question that was asked, but could potentially be helpful if people are wondering. I don't think Kay brought us on for a specifically on topic conversation. If she did, I apologize in advance. <laughs> No, I think, I mean, this is, these are areas that when we talk about sort of the fragility of uh, infrastructure, we talk about, um, and especially for Invest in Open Infrastructure's work in talking about the investment and increasing the funding and resourcing, you know, to me, that's so much more than just the financial side of things. It is also looking at the health of the ecosystem. It's looking at the people that are involved. And I know from the conversations that we had um, through that research over the past year that many people on this call participated in and we'll be sharing more about over the coming weeks, um, you know, recognizing that the staffing implications, given that so much of this was either, and so much of the um, support for these projects, either based on soft money or in-kind contributions, you know, in off hours or that are unaccounted for, it makes it very difficult to understand um, the costs associated, the actual financial costs, to be able to build that into budgets, but also looking at the sort of layer cake of it's not just the software development it's also the individuals who are helping with the training pointing people to the resources the governance the decision making the roadmaps all of that and when you take away the ability for you know and that relationship to time what that means for um, the sustainability of some of these projects and even viability of these projects and um, equity and equity. And I know that you both have been looking at issues around equity, um, especially around this uh, in various ways. So I think kind of moving into some of that dimension, would love to know a little bit about what your thoughts are and what's percolating to the surface, um, especially as we're kind of coming into, you know, the pandemic's not over, but we are um, moving into, you know, the latter half of, of 2021 and what feels, um, you know, what are you noticing in your work around that? Okay, well, I'll jump in here and I will we'll try to keep myself on time um, so I can hand the baton right back over to Lewis. So um, thank you so much for that, Caitlin. Yeah, I'm really excited about this question. I'm excited about all of these questions, but I'm very excited about this question. Um, and just being an active thinker with all of you about, about what these things mean um, personally and then how that translates into your practice. Uh, so I just wanna throw a few things out at first, kind of primers um, or anchor points maybe. Um, the first thing is, you know, I brought up a kind of occupational hierarchy uh, pyramid earlier as it pertains to, to innovation associated labor as opposed to maintenance associated labor. but. Also, we can think about kind of um, operations or implementation or structural commitment to equity. And on the one hand, right, like the base of the pyramid, and then the mission and sort of the values and principles as, as further to the top of the pyramid with the mission and vision at the very top. Um, process and policy, they're more extensive. They cover the functional and operational aspects of the ideas that are inherent in the mission and vision and the values and principles. Um, and I just want to start there and say that one, there are numerous frameworks for anti-oppressive feminist, anti-oppressive policy assessments, such as one that's actually called, uh, um, uh, I think it's FARO, F-A-R-A-O. So I'll share that one with Kay too. But yeah, and I also wanna throw out a few things that I've been using to think with lately that I think uh, could be really useful for this community to think with, uh, to think about together. So these are from some distinctive readings and I'll go quickly through these, um, or actually one is a speech. I 
we talk a lot about people orientation versus thing orientation. We talk about it a lot at maintainers and we talk about it a lot as educopians within the context of the projects that we work with, several of which are open infrastructure, technically foregrounded projects. Um, and I, the other day I was watching a, a documentary. It's great. It's on PBS. You can watch it for free um, on the activist and um, philosopher Grace Lee Boggs. And she shares a clip, it's from a 1971 speech from Martin Luther King Jr. on, it's called Beyond Vietnam. And he actually says in that speech that we, in order to advance as a society, we really need to move um, away from a thing orientation and more towards a people orientation. And I think that's, that's an interesting thing that I'll tap down. Another one is um, in Raymond Williams, who is a cultural scholar, uh, he wrote this book called Keywords, and one of the keywords that he defines in there is the term community, and how community is an interesting term because there's no negative opposite, so to speak, and it has this warmly persuasive quality. Um, and so I think thinking about how we're using that terminology in the context of sort of driving, advocating, advertising, um, for the development of new open infrastructure projects is an interesting question that I'd like to put to this group. And then also um, to bring up Anna Hoffman, who is a scholar and wrote a great article on um, sort of um, discourse on data and inclusion. She asked the reader to think about the fact that in technological discourse, you know, it's almost never no it's always how do we do it better or how do we do more? How do we get more data to improve the quality of the model or whatever the case may be? And so she's asking us to think about, are there cases where the answer is no, not more when it comes to technology? Um, and then the last one I'll throw out there is, is from um, Sasha Costanza Shock and the members of the Design Justice Network which is one of the design justice principles is to look for what's already working and to ask the question, are we the right ones to build this particular tool or piece of infrastructure? Um, and so, so those are all kinds of ideas around equity that I want to bring up as anchor points. And also this question around just the open movement more broadly, right? Like assuming that open is an inherent good in all cases. And I'm sure that many of you have had very you know, extensive conversations about this. But I'll just point to the work of Maui Hudson, Stephanie Russo Carroll, and Jane Anderson, among many others, in terms of the indigenous data sovereignty movement. Um, and they have this whole portfolio of specific projects that are driving at this, the TK labels, the CARE principles, uh, which is in conjunction with the FAIR principles for data curation and governance. Um, and they're currently working on what does it mean to develop a standard for indigenous data provenance? And that's interesting because when, you know, with the TK labels and with these standards for indigenous data provenance, this question around access, I think becomes very importantly problematized. And that won't be the first time y'all have kind of heard that provocation, but I would bring it up in this context. Um, and I wanna just two more things here and then I'll hand it over to, to Lewis. Um, also drawing recently within Educopia as an organization, on this work around, uh, by Adrienne Marie Brown, who is uh, a facilitator, a doula, uh, a visionary fiction writer, uh, a mediator. She's quite amazing, an activist. And there are two concepts that have done a lot of good work for us. One is functional interdependence. And this is from her book, um, Emergent Strategy. And there's another uh, concept on liberated, what are, what are components of liberated relationships? And so as it pertains to equity here, two of the actions that Adrienne Marie Brown says, we have to take over and over again as individuals every day towards functional interdependence um, is being seen, so this is making your work or your status as a person, you know, where you're at more visible. And then also asking for and receiving what we need. And those are both directed at individuals as their work to do, again, in, in her text. But I also think it's worth reminding everyone that our projects and our programs have to be ready to receive this, right? We have to be co-creating a culture or transforming 
our existing cultural context in which open infrastructure work is taking place in order to receive and respond to that, right? Being seen through the lens of the organization. And especially because transparency is often and has been documented by the NGLP project um, as, or or was it um, the, the, one of the previous open and kind of open portfolio projects around landscape scanning, but transparency is a common value within the open movement and scholarly communications landscape. So I think that it's just worth saying that if you tie together individual needs, right, for kind of self-realization or for feeling and being valued as part of an open source infrastructure project and their contributions, it's them get, being given the space um, and kind of the cultural components to feel safe in articulating what they need. But it's also about how is the project or the program structured in such a way, what tools are being used in terms of project management and things like that, that guide the work in ways that make making labor visible easier. So I know that that was like a, a big combination of kind of concrete tools on the ground that speak to these kind of higher level concepts or ideals, um, as well as just some ideas to throw around. But I think that I think that those are important points. And the last one that I'll mention also from Adrienne Marie Brown is on liberated relationships um, and what keeps us from having those uh, in relationship with each other. But Three things, principal disagreement, which I'm finding often in many of uh, group contexts that I work with is we don't always have good containers or tools for principal disagreement. And this is how we unearth things like assumptions um, and sort of divergence in assumptions, as well as different stakes that individuals have in the success of the project or the program. Also being in complexity, uh, being in the complexity of the power dynamics that are at play and understanding how to acknowledge those and still keep moving forward. Um, and then also just being mindful that, you know, to, to Kay's earlier point and opening up this question, you're not, we're not all creating people to be with, right? We're not all creating like the perfect team uh, or like this perfect moment of cohesion and shared understanding. We're working towards that with people that have their full lives behind them and ahead of them. So to be curious about people in that way. And I know that those are, again, a, a kind of a combination of very high level thoughts and then some very granular to do's. Um, but I just wanted to, to offer those thoughts up. You know, I want to pull on one particular string uh, that, that Jessica was teasing out there in a, in a couple of those points. And that's about, uh, and, and also what uh, somebody brought up in the chat, uh, this, the word community is a hyper abused word. Uh, and yet at the same time, we, those of us who have been doing this for a long time, problematize it in, I think, some very good ways, right? Um, I spent some time as the head of community at Wikipedia. And boy, uh, you know, this very much, uh, I think there's an awareness at the Wikimedia Foundation, which is the nonprofit that maintains the underlying technological infrastructure of Wikipedia. There's an understanding there driven by some very thoughtful uh, staff and, and the recently departed executive director, uh, Catherine Marr, uh, of, you know, boy, we built this whole infrastructure that works really well in English and German and like fairly well in French and Spanish for like, you know, for, for topics of North America and Europe. Uh, and what does it mean to build that out in the Indian subcontinent? What does it mean to build that out in various indigenous communities uh, globally? And that's a real, um, the, the, the thing, so, so one, I mean, I do think that there are successful organizations out there uh, trying to take these problematizations seriously in a day-to-day -day, uh, kind of context. So that's good. But on the flip side, particularly the romance of open is very much tied to this vision of volunteers coming in and doing work. And like, there's this very real tension between, um, you know, the volunteers who are doing this work, 
are not by and large sitting down and reading entire books on the problematization of communities. They're there because it's fun. And, and, and certainly some of them are receptive, right? I don't wanna like cast a uniformly negative especially in Wikipedia, lots of the people are thoughtful intellectual types. And when you provide a thoughtful intellectual critique, they're going to get it, right? But at the same time, you are also saying, hey, you know what, your hobby that is fun, and that like, honestly, you know, probably on balance, despite the problematization is really a good thing for the world, right? Like, I don't, I don't want to be the one saying, uh, and, I, and I will not be the one saying, like, actually, Wikipedia is bad. Like, I, I think that's like, you know, that there, there are people out there saying that. And I think like you've maybe crawled a little too far up your belly, your own belly button. Like you're, you're a little too self-reflexive if like that's your takeaway is Wikipedia is bad. Um, you know, does Wikipedia have a lot of problems that absolutely need to be addressed? Like, absolutely. I'll be the first one to tell you that. And you know, the part of the trick is, and part of what makes this so uh, different from maintenance in like the physical infrastructure world, nobody volunteers to build, well, that's not strictly true. I mean, we can go into a whole lot of Ostrom here, but again, time limits. Um, you know, people by and large don't volunteer to build physical infrastructure, right? Um, and whereas they do volunteer to uh, build this, this digital commons, and so there's a very real, um, the, the art of telling these volunteers like, hey, this thing that is so much fun for you that you do it on your weekends and that you do it in your spare time and you do it truly deeply for the love, right? Amateur in the best Latin sense of that word of, of ama, of love, um, is actually really problematic is a very hard conversation to have. Um, I, I think I've been watching with a little bit of awe from a distance. I left the Wikimedia Foundation about five years ago and I've been watching from a distance as it has tried to navigate these very complex, they put in their first uh, universal code of conduct recently, right? Which uh, the point of that was in part to tell these volunteers like, hey, this thing that you're doing is A, awesome, B, don't be a jerk while you're doing it, um, like it's a lot more nuanced than that, right? But like for some people that is literally like to go in and say, there's an entire community of um, older North American and European men who are super obsessed with the battles of World War II or like, you know, uh, obscure major league baseball players from like the 1920s who each by dint of having played even a single at bat in major league baseball are deemed to be uh, are, are deemed to be worthy of inclusion in Wikipedia. And, uh, you know, and then, and then they all go around saying, Oh, a woman doing science. I don't know if that's like, I, you know, I don't know if that's good enough to be in Wikipedia and and like you have to, and there are a lot of converts, right? There are a lot of people who once you say like, actually, let's look at this sort of systematically. What you just said is deeply problematic. Like there are converts uh, with, with all the zeal of, of true converts, right? Who will go around and like, who will go around Wikipedia and defend these articles. But the fact that it has to be done, you know, you don't have the levers of a professional, there's no like, you know, and, and we all know professional organizations, there's a whole nother issue with like, what does professionalism mean in our brave new world and things like that, right? But like, there's no, a lot of the levers that we use to drive equity in professional settings are absent in volunteer settings, right? And, and so it becomes a very difficult conversation to have. Uh, for in a lot of these settings, right? And that drives this equity problem that is very, it doesn't drive the, I mean, it's not the source of it, but like it really complicates when you go around to volunteers and say like, this is awesome, really glad you're having fun. And also have you looked around at your panels? Uh, it's sort of gross, you should fix that. Um, like that, that's a even harder conversation having a volunteer, converse, volunteer context in my opinion. Uh, than in a paid context. Yeah, yeah Jessica, uh, whose knowledge is amazing. Um, 
Anasuya, who, uh, who co-founded Hughes Knowledge, was my predecessor in that role at Wikipedia. And she's just amazing. Everybody should look at what they're doing. Uh, it's really terrific. Yeah. And I know we are. So we have just over 15 minutes until the top of the hour. Huge. Thanks. <laughs> I would have this conversation all day. I mean, I think it warrants many, many, many more conversations. But just a reminder, um, if anyone has any questions that they want to pop into the chat, we can see how many of those we can dig into in our um, in our final moments. While folks think about that, um, we'd love, I mean, so we've talked about uh, a number of different dimensions of the, the problems at hand, of the complexity, of the uh, devaluing of some of labor, the, the challenges and even making it visible. Um, the, you know, and I think we probably continued going on there. And I think, Louis, your point about the levers that we have in professional settings, how those get applied in volunteer settings, and also the recognition, the equity issues at the core of this. Um, so as we kind of seek to like wrap up this conversation, would love to hear, and I would say a minute or two for each of you, um, what you see as kind of next steps forward or things we should be paying attention to as a community um, as we look at ways in which we can help, you know, advance that agenda. Big question, small nod time. Uh, so I don't know if people will be shocked by my response to this, and but I do think it's, it's um, I think it's highly relevant in almost any context. And the more I do the work, the more that I realize how we none of none of us are born with facilitation skills. So I have two I have two answers to that question. One, I would like for Lewis, if he wants to take it here, um, to go into a deeper dive on this. And I'd also be curious from follow on from this session to learn more from Caitlin about how IOI is is looking at this question of inspectability of the source of where that middle portion of, of Lewis's um, slide on the survey results, how, how deep can you go sort of like down that, um, that provenantial thread of where the, the big uh, body of work that the open infrastructure that's actually custom built by many of the projects and programs that are funded and might be represented by people on this call, like that underlying infrastructure that they lean on that is that volunteer labor or not by and large, like just what is what are some thoughts around how, how inspectable that is to go back to the levers or the sticks and carrots of professional organizations? And what are, yeah, what are some of those um, criteria, investment criteria that are developing? And just like how feasible is it to, um, to enforce that? And what does it look like? So that's, that's a general question I know IOI is grappling with. But Across the board, whether you're in, um, you have community managers for volunteer contexts, uh, open source development contexts, or you are having a, a project or program team meeting on all the, the stakeholders or the actual staff at varying degrees and roles that are working within an open inf uh, infrastructure project. This comes from my experience. Um, as I said, I think while projects do need because think about this, y'all, open infrastructure projects by nature of infrastructure, right, are relatively large in scale, potentially, right, they're at least being designed for scale, which implicates the need for cross-functional, possibly interprofessional, possibly cross-sectoral, possibly interdisciplinary teams in order for adoption, full implementation, and ongoing processes and maintenance, okay? That's a really big scope. And what's inherent in that is you're going to have lots of people coming from lots of different spaces in terms of how they learn, what questions they think are the most interesting, what they're gonna prioritize when you have you know, every functional silos priority on the table, how those are gonna be different. So I say all that to say, while projects still need really good project management and product owners, and those are specific roles, projects need good facilitation. And the recognition that we don't often talk about that as key labor, sort of uh, articulation work, the work that makes the work work, if y'all have heard that. So this idea that very concretely, you know, like there are teams and I'm a part of many of them <laughs> that do regularly quarter retrospectives or you do a retrospective after a sprint, right? And some of those retrospectives are great. They're celebratory, but they also surface clear and next step priorities and opportunities for improving things. They allow space for disagreement so that the whole team can get better. Um, and I just want to argue that 
ways of creating containers for scoping, containers for planning, containers for conflict. These are containers so that people feel safe being seen in their needs. These are things we don't inherently know how to do. Um, but we assume that that infrastructure is going to be there. And it's not. So one thing that, again, may not surprise anyone, I'll put a vote out there for thinking about the role of facilitation and what that means in supporting open infrastructure that is in accordance or embodies the values and principles that I think that this community by and large all support and want to embody. So that, that'll be my vote for facilitation, <laughs> Lewis. Uh, boy, um, I, I, I mean, so one, I realize that coming from the software industry, I have a, uh, a, a place of some luck and privilege here, uh, which is, I have, to, and, and, and I found a tide lift because of this, um, I absolutely think part of the answer is money, right? Like the luxury of the software industry is that we are flowing in money, we're just not distributing it very well. And uh, which is, you know, different from a lot of other types of infrastructure work. And I, I want to acknowledge that up front. But that, you know, for like, look, uh, I mean, capitalism is what capitalism is. I, I, I have, I, I, I get into many of these conversations where somebody's answer is like, well, okay, but step one is we defeat capitalism. I'm like, okay, but in the meantime, like, I get it thumbs up uh, and I'll, uh, and I actually have a great, <laughs> just gonna add to Kay's reading list of uh, things to, uh, on, on neo-Luddism. Uh, but anyway, um, the, the, so, you know, that that's, I mean, that's part of my answer is distributing that. You just got, I thought you asked a great question about this computability of the 70% there, right? And we find ourselves in a very, <sighs> you know, uh, perfect the enemy of the good kind of situation, a tide lift. Unlike a lot of kinds of infrastructure problems, we literally can sit there and compute what's the value, like who is providing the value in that 70%, right? Where we can walk, uh, software has the concept of a dependency chain. That's a very old concept in, uh, in software. And so you can literally walk that dependency chain and see like, ah, this is, you know, we can call out, we can say, oh, you know what? 70% of things use left pad. Uh, we should, like, that's an important link in a way that is hard to do for a lot of traditional kinds of infrastructure problems. So that's the, that's the good. The perfect is that that only captures certain kinds of contribution, right? Like we can measure, we can literally look and say, all right, who has contributed code to left pad? But we can't capture, or it's not, we're not well set up, and that's not just a title of the thing, that's an industry wide problem. Uh, capturing who did documentation for left pad, who did facilitation for left pad, uh, who did, I got my start in the industry um, in uh, something called what we call bug triage, which is essentially like, oh, uh, you know, millions of people are now using it, thousands of them are going to file bugs. How do you? funnel that into a useful 10 bugs for the developer to actually spend their time on, right? Somebody's got to do that, that winnowing. And that is not a represented, like that's not something that our algorithm currently captures at all. We're keenly aware of that shortcoming, but at the same time, it's such a diversity of ways to do it that trying to convert that into an algorithm in a way that scales across the literally tens or hundreds of thousands of projects this has to scale across you know, we're, we're trying again, like we could let that stop the whole project. <laughs> um, and, and we're trying very hard not to, right? And we're trying very hard to say, you know what, those things are in our minds, we want to solve that problem. Uh, right now, we're going to focus on the, on the code maintainership, because that is what is tractable, and hopefully will drive enough value that in version two of Tidelift, we start talking a whole lot about documentation and facilitation, project or product management. Um, no, I think that that's really important. And Jessica, just to kind of build on what Lewis was saying, and I think that the, you know, I love that, um, you know, part of the reason that I really wanted Lewis to be part of this conversation and also you, Jessica, is I think that the, 
the means in which we talk about, you know, the who is providing value and that dependency chain and some of the work that's been done by groups like Tidelift and other organizations to say, how can we map like what you're reliant on? I mean, I know when we talk about open infrastructure in terms of the systems, the software, the protocols, et cetera, there is that reliance piece that I think is really fundamental in what differentiates that from like, do you notice if this piece gets taken away? And there's some great examples that have been cited here so far. And I will pull together a reference list because there's some incredible resources that have been mentioned um, both by you both and also in the chat. But I think for, for IOI's perspective, it's um, you know part of what we are building out a team for, and um, we did receive some funding to kind of dig into this more, uh, more intently in terms of the hidden costs of infrastructure, is almost looking at the anti-patterns. Like we know what is not accounted for and if we are going to look towards, you know, increasing the investment sustainability health of supporting these core projects and figuring out strategies forward for institutions, for those who could provide funding or financing or staffing, et cetera, you know, we need to have a better understanding of what is, you know, the necessary support or what is getting us a little bit closer. And so some of that work is is going to be, you know, yes, quantitative where we have information, but also a lot of that is qualitative. Um, we have, we know going into this that, for example, we we've heard from a number of institutional stakeholders that, in terms of staffing, that is often lumped into overhead budgets, and it's not unpacked in a way that's easily uh, discernible. And so, in many cases, we're almost looking at like the anti patterns, what's not being included and then trying to draw from other examples. So I would say stay tuned for more work on that. We'll be sharing out some of that exploration as we go into it, but it's really important. Um, so we can get past some of the chronic underfunding of the space and understand what is an appropriate amount that we need to be calling for and not just be calling for from one funder, but be calling for in terms of communal and collective investment. So hopefully that wove together a couple of points there. I know we have five minutes and I wanna make sure we have this hard stop. Um, any, I'm, I'm not seeing any questions. I'm seeing lots of resources and keep those coming. I'll be sure to share that out. And as well as this video and the video from our previous webinar um, on our blog with resources. Um, any final words from you both before we kind of move to close? Louis, go ahead. Do you have anything? I'll this just say thank you. Yeah, I mean, mostly I want to say thank you. I want to say uh, I'm really glad that there's uh, that there's a community out there thinking about this in in a sophisticated way. Like one of my constant, I'm I'm the I mean, yeah, I'm like a you know, I'm I'm a certain kind of nerd uh, who happens to have stumbled into an executive role, and uh, so I'm I'm you know, I hope I can pull some of these ideas across the boundaries into industry and certainly in our space. Um, so yeah, excited to be a part of this ongoing, never going to be finished conversation. Well said, Lewis. And I'll also be specific and say, thank you. I was just typing this in the chat. Um, yes, to all the resources shared, I just had a chance to briefly go through. So um, huge thanks to all of you for engaging in, in Lewis's ideas and in my ideas and, and sharing your own experience because they're so, there's so much kind of personal testimony in here um, that connect to the things that we discussed and it's really valuable. So thank you all so much for sharing that as well. Great. Well, with that, you know, I want to thank you both for, for joining us and also everybody else who's joined the call and been so active in uh, the chat here. We will be pulling together resources and uh, Jessica and Lewis, I will also put that open to you if there are things that were not mentioned in this call that come to you afterwards that we can share out um, because this is such a robust topic. Um, for the participants of this call uh, to keep in mind that we are going to be continuing to explore this work and there'll be opportunities to engage with that. Um, but please feel free to reach out to us if there's ways in which we can help you with, um, you know, exploring these topics in your own spaces. Um, our next webinar, which uh, we are looking at kind of finalizing the date, we'll be talking hopefully about um, what it looks like to have a shared agenda for investing in open infrastructure building on the topics that we've talked about from technical resilience to the human cost of infrastructure and learning from those who are exploring this in different jurisdictions around the world as well as in different contexts and with approaches as well. So huge thanks again for you all joining us. And with that, have a wonderful rest of your day.
Thank you, everybody. Hey, everybody.